Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I am joined again by the wonderful, delightful, gorgeous, stunning Emily Cahill. <laughs> Emily is part of our Kidney Coach team and a very valued member. Um, if you haven't come across Emily before, she's often answering your emails. If you're part of our um, Beat Kidney Disease Solution Program, uh, she's often answering Facebook posts. And if you really want to see Emily in action, head over to www.kidneycoach.com and then hit articles and you'll see that she has been the writer of pretty much all the latest articles that have gone up. So while we've been busy doing other things, we're very grateful to have Emily be able to produce such amazing content um, for our community. So thank you for joining us, Emily. Oh, and I should mention Emily is a registered nurse and a fully qualified naturopath. And she works in a great big cardiovascular clinic in Melbourne. So she's seeing uh, cardiovascular disease and as a side effect, kidneys and, mm. and those sort of things a lot. So Today we wanted to talk about magnesium because Emily and I both have a bit of a love affair with this nutrient and how important it is in the early stages, maybe not so much the late stages, but the early stages of chronic kidney disease and how the nutrient can be super effective, especially if you've got some of these uh, co-diseases like cardiovascular disease, diabetes and those sort of things. So Emily, why don't you uh, start by just telling us what magnesium is and then go from there? <laughs> Right. Uh, so magnesium is a mineral that we get from the food that we eat that's present in our body. Uh, and it's really important for, it's got, you know, a huge number of actions. So it's involved in about, you know, 300 reactions within the body. We need it for making our proteins. We need it for our blood glucose control. We need it for our brain to work well. We need it for our immune system. Um, to make healthy bone and also just for the structure and function of all of the different enzymes in our body for making DNA, RNA, making energy as well. So it's got a huge number of different actions, which also means that if we're not getting enough, that we can have a really wide variety of different symptoms or different conditions sort of coming from it. Mm. And I guess that's also one of the difficulties with it because you know, there's no set, I guess, signs or symptoms and that can be quite non-specific. but often a magnesium deficiency isn't picked up um, and blood testing is problematic and maybe we can talk about that in a little bit as well. That makes it, you know, not very easy too. But, yeah, it's one of those things that can be easily overlooked that people aren't often unaware that they're, that they're deficient in magnesium. What are some of them? I know it is very broad reaching, but I know there's some as naturopaths we look out for. What are the major, you know, if you someone's thinking, well, do I have magnesium deficiency? What are some of the symptoms that they may experience? I think some that I probably, uh, the top two that really spark kind of when I hear someone say it, I go, well, oh, it's most likely magnesium, magnesium is muscle cramps um, and also twitching of little muscles. So, um, like if you get a little twitch in your eyelid or something like that, that can be really classic in terms of magnesium. Uh, but then things like fatigue, because it's really important in making energy, uh, weakness. If someone's got uh, low bone mineral density, so osteopenia or osteoporosis, that's sort of, you know, getting a bit further down the track of being magnesium deficient. Uh, problems with mood, so it's also important for some of our neurotransmitters. And problems with sleep as well. Yeah, and anxiety too. And um, yeah, yeah, I definitely see those. And then the other one that I sometimes see is people get, and again, it has, this has to be a chronic thing, is they get um, vertical ridges in their nails. Those really bumpy, mm -hmm. bumpy nails. But again, it's been there for a while. If you're getting your nail nail changes, so mm -hmm. um, so. Tell us what are the major actions of magnesium in the body and why is it so important in things like chronic kidney disease? Yeah, so some of the ways I guess that magnesium is particularly important for the kidneys is that it's really important for our cardiovascular system. So magnesium, having low magnesium is a risk factor of having high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. It's also needed for the regulation of glucose, so blood sugar levels and the action of insulin, which is our hormone that helps to lower blood sugar in our body as well. And it's also an anti-inflammatory. 
nutrient as well and reduces oxidative stress, which is something that causes damage within our cells and tissues. And also that's one of the driving, I guess, factors in kidney disease. So low magnesium levels is also linked to uh, high levels of inflammation and oxidative stress. Mm-hmm. Um, then I guess in terms of our risk factors for kidney disease, a lot of the risk factors or the health conditions that are associated with higher risk are also associated with magnesium deficiency. So as I mentioned, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, uh, heart failure, metabolic syndrome, uh, all of those are associated with magnesium deficiency. Yeah. So you mentioned tests before. Do you want to go there now? Like how do, yeah. how would, if people, because often, you know, some people don't get the muscle twitching, they don't get the ridges mm-hmm. in the, you know, in the nails and, and it would be the biggest deficiency that I see in clinic. What, how would someone know, apart from the signs and symptoms we talked about, how could you test for a magnesium deficiency and how accurate is that test? Yeah, so probably the most common <clears throat> test is just uh, testing magnesium on a blood test. There's two different ways that you can do that, and there's serum magnesium and then there's red blood cell magnesium. Now, I would say definitely if I'm seeing people who've had their magnesium levels checked, 90% of the time they're being checked on serum magnesium. That's oh. a it's a cheaper blood test to do. Yep, um, it's yeah, and tends to be what you know we we do see magnesium checked quite a lot um, in the cardiovascular ward because of how important it is for heart function, and it's always serum magnesium. Really? Yeah. That, sorry to I, that just blows my brains that they're not checking red cell. Sorry, brain blown. So maybe you can tell us why my brain's blown because (laughs) red cell, take it away. (laughs) So the majority of magnesium in our body is not within our bloodstream. So most of the magnesium is actually in our bones uh, and then in our muscles and other tissues. And then we have some in our red blood cells and the leftover part the point something percent part is actually in our um, blood, in the serum of our blood. So if we're testing magnesium through serum levels, we're looking, we're not seeing the full picture. And the other problem is because our body will always try to keep things, particularly within our blood, within a certain range, what it will do is it'll take magnesium from other places in order to keep that blood magnesium within range. So It'll take magnesium from your bone. It'll take magnesium from the tissues. It'll take magnesium from your red blood cells to take it into the serum to try to keep it within a specific range. So you might get your um, magnesium tested on serum and it might look normal. It might look slightly on the low side, but even if it looks completely normal, you can't know that you're not magnesium deficient. So because your body is potentially, if you know, we've got deficiency over a long period of time, it's taking it from all of those other places. Yeah. And so red cell, um, I mean, again, it's not ideal, but obviously more yeah. accurate. It's going to give you a more complete picture. Sorry, here comes the yeah. crazy part. A more complete picture than, than serum. And I guess my thing too with even red cell is, and that's the one I'm, I'm really lucky to work with at a really great doctor, um, that that does get checked. Hello, here's Apollo to come and say hello to everybody. <laughs> but red cell magnesium, the reference range on it is crazy. You know, it's I think it's 0.65 to 1 round there, something like that. Um, and often people will have a red cell magnesium of 0.7, 0.75 and they're told it's normal but uh, I think it's Japan their red cell magnesium range I think goes from 1 to 1.7 so countries and this is an Australian range so countries have very different uh, red cell magnesium reference ranges and of course the way Australia works at least is that reference range is just taken off the general population and said this is what most people have here's the reference range it's not a reference range of ideal health and since I believe, and it sounds like you do too, most people are magnesium deficient. When we've got those really low reference ranges, we're probably already looking at the beginnings of magnesium deficiency. For me, I like people's red cell magnesium over one, and I rarely see that. 
I mean, I take a lot of um, magnesium and I do it IV and mine only just has bumped over one. So, yeah, I find those reference ranges are nuts. So, yeah, yeah, I'm still blown away that in a cardiovascular unit in hospital they're checking serum. I just want to smack my head. (laughs) (sighs) Okay. So someone has had their red cell magnesium tested and it's on the low side of the normal reference range, which is probably, I don't know about you, that's what I'm seeing mostly. Mm-hmm. What then would you suggest to people? How would you treat a suspect, let's say they've got a little bit of muscle twitching, they're a bit fatigued and then their red cell magnesium on the blood test a bit low. What would you do about that? Uh, so, you know, primarily we do want to get our nutrients from food. But so, yes, boosting uh, the amount of magnesium you're getting through your diet is important. But when someone's actually deficient, you're never going to be able to eat enough um, and get enough magnesium from your diet to actually increase those levels. So then it would be looking at magnesium supplementation. And is there a preferred? So let's go through that. So I just want to make sure we haven't missed anything. Is there anything else we need to say about magnesium and why before I go down the rabbit hole of treatment anything let's talk about magnesium and why it's so important in kidney disease and everything else yeah so um you know largely a lot of it as I mentioned was is about reducing inflammation and oxidative stress and also reducing those other factors that are both risk factors for kidney disease starting but also uh causing progression so uh whether it be high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, Also, you know, the kidneys are the ones that are responsible, like a lot of our minerals, for um, excreting minerals from the body and for balancing minerals in the body as well. So having our kidneys functioning properly helps for our body to be able to regulate its own magnesium levels. Like the body is quite amazing and it will do everything it can to try to keep magnesium levels within range so if our magnesium levels are low we will actually absorb more from the food that we're eating because our body's trying to boost them if we're eating a lot of magnesium and we've you know we've got enough within our body then we'll excrete more through the kidneys so the body's constantly trying to keep that balance and the kidneys are part of keeping that balance as well so as people get, and because this is something that I know that a lot of renal dietitians and nephrologists will recommend to the patients, especially if they're on dialysis, is to avoid magnesium. So walk us through that and that's just a follow on from what you were saying there. Yeah. So once kidney disease gets to, you know, most research will say about stage four, stage five, that ability to excrete more magnesium is reduced, which means that we can end up with higher levels of magnesium within the body because we're not able to get rid of it like um, we should be able to. And that's why, you know, in some people supplementing with magnesium can be problematic because we don't want, you know, there, there are problems obviously with magnesium deficiency, but like everything, there's also problems with having magnesium levels too high as well. So we don't want to be causing that um that issue and so because we know how unreliable the tests are how are people going to know whether they should supplement with magnesium or not is the big question yes yeah exactly so i guess um you know yes the tests are unreliable but one thing they do show you is that if you are in the lower range uh of normal you know even sort of mid to lower range the likelihood is that you are low in magnesium because your body has most likely had to take it from your bone or take it from your tissues just to keep you even in that lower range. Mm. So, you know, I think that the test can be useful at times to confirm that a deficiency is present. It just depends on the way you're reading the test. Um, So that's one thing. You know, the other thing as well is looking at, what people are eating in the day and so how much magnesium they're actually getting in their food because if they're not getting enough magnesium in their food then you know they're going to be magnesium deficient too um and then looking at signs and symptoms as well so signs and symptoms of magnesium deficiency other risk factors so things that you know are going on in the body that can increase the risk of magnesium deficiency as well so putting that all together 
Um, you know, so yeah, I guess it's not it's not looking only at at one part to try to work out if someone needs supplementation. When we're concerned about the potential for having high magnesium levels, that is something that typically you will see on a blood test. So it's you know someone's not going to have um, high levels of magnesium without that showing up on a blood test. Does that make sense? It does. And you even see that in a serum. So if someone's in hospital, yeah. they're having dialysis and they're running their typical tests and their magnesium is low normal, but the blanket rule, it's a bit like our um, potassium phosphorus conversation, the blanket rule is to omit magnesium. Do you agree with that? Or would you be putting some in if a blood test was suggesting it's low and they've got signs and symptoms of it? Yeah, I still put it in. Okay. And I just, I have to play devil's advocate there because of course, the, and I had, this came across from a renal dietitian who emailed um, our customer support team just the other day saying blanket rule, no magnesium in people with dialysis. And I guess my thing is, well, how do you know? Like you can't, it's the same as the potassium phosphorus. If we know magnesium is so important, especially at preventing comorbidity diseases why would we omit it unless there is compelling evidence that the kidneys are not filtering magnesium out um and so again it's one of those things if you are in stage five renal disease and you are on dialysis and you've got low uh, magnesium levels you're going to need to work with a very open-minded very well-versed practitioner who can help you get your levels up but keep them safe in a in a level that's you know not impairing and you just have to do that via regular blood testing um monitoring symptoms but that's such a tough one because it's one that you and i see all the time where these we get these blanket rules of things that you have to avoid in kidney disease and it's a as you can tell it's a bugbear of mine because we may be omitting major nutrients that could have such a huge impact and you know and being anti-inflammatory and and all of those things and just simple things like improving sleep quality which we know you need for a, a human to heal um magnesium is one of the most efficient ways that i know to do that yet we're chopping out some things that potentially could progress the disease because we've got these blanket rules and stuff. I don't know how you may have some ideas. I don't know how we get around that or how we work with specialists unless we've got people that are really great at doing regular blood tests and they're open to that. Yeah, that's right. And I think as well, you know, something else interesting that I was looking at some research recently about magnesium levels in people on dialysis and it's actually showing that those people who had elevated magnesium on a blood test, so actually higher than the reference range on a blood test, so that would be, you know, particularly when generally speaking doctors would be concerned about about high magnesium, mm -hmm. that actually improved outcomes. So there was... Really? <clears throat> yeah. I'm so, amazed at this. This is a polo, by the way. So <laughs> high, high magnesium on a blood test, those people had yeah. better long-term outcomes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then those who had normal, um, you know, serum magnesium. Wow, and of course that's not anything that's discussed or mm -mm. talked about. So um, thank you for discussing that research. I haven't come across that. That makes complete sense to me because mm -hmm. of all the actions that you spoke about of what magnesium does with anti-inflammatory and antioxidant and blood sugar regulation, of course that would. So why? So where did the avoiding magnesium in dialysis patients come from? Is that something that got made up or is, is there evidence to suggest it is an issue? Um, I'm I'm not sure. I think part of the difficulty with it is that because um, over time the I guess dialysis solution or dialyzers have changed. So when the research has been done, it's been done with different. There's different amounts of magnesium that can be used in the dialyzers, and that's typically how they balance out people on dialysis as magnesium levels is through the solution that they're using. So there seems to be a bit of conflicting research in terms of where the level should be because typically people's levels were always quite low because they were using such a low amount of magnesium in the, um, the dialysis solution. So I think I'm not sure if that's why that in time as that's changed and that they've changed the levels that then they've had to sort of go back and look at all the research. 
I don't know if it's just a bit of an assumption thing, like, well, the kidneys can't get rid of it properly and therefore it's in high levels and therefore that's bad. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't come across, you know, I haven't come across any research that's specific, I guess, to people in dialysis of issues with having high magnesium. You know, I guess there are things that we, you know, we know that high magnesium can potentially cause problems, but in terms specifically of people with kidney disease, I haven't. I've not seen that. Fascinating. So potentially more magnesium, in, well, not potentially, some studies are suggesting high magnesium blood levels improve long-term outcomes of kidney disease. Yeah. Exactly, exactly what we saw with potassium. And so yeah. it's fascinating that a lot of these blanket rules that are applied to dialysis patients and kidney disease patients, research is now starting to suggest otherwise and maybe potentially the way that these long-term patients have been uh, supported and treated is actually leading to a faster decline. And I'm just putting this out there, so I'm not saying that that's, that is the case, but potentially the fact that we're not supporting healthy magnesium levels and looking at things like potassium, that we're actually speeding up the decline in kidney function maybe, which is Well, scary. that's what the research shows. Well, there you go. So, I mean, it's really scary when we talk about this because these are such common Blanket rules applied to especially stage five kidney disease. And that, yeah. again, boils my brains and boils my blood because I feel like we're not helping our dialysis patients potentially reduce the frequency of dialysis and giving them good long term potential outcomes while they're waiting for transplants and things like that. Because there's so many things we could be doing, like supporting. Um, basic things like magnesium levels because it's so massively important in every system of our body and all the co-diseases that go with it and having dialysis I can only imagine I know what it's like with my health condition would be stressful and so magnesium being the major nutrient and mineral that we burn during stress is going to be low due to probably the chronic stress of having dialysis and waiting for a transplant so yeah, very fascinating. So, what do you, what do people that are on di- say? Let's say we've got someone with stage five, and they are listening to this, and they're thinking, "Well, hello, I've been told to completely avoid magnesium. I'm chronically stressed. I don't sleep. My muscles are fatigued. All the symptoms of having chronic kidney disease. Um, you know, I've got brain fog. I'm muscle twitching all the time. I've actually got some vertical ridges in my nails. How do I talk to my nephrologist or my, you know, dialysis nurses? How do I maybe Get some magnesium in there. What do I do? Uh, so I think, you know, starting point is having your magnesium levels tested. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you've got, I guess, if particularly if they are low and whether that's just lower uh, in the reference range or because often I'll see them being low below the reference range, Mm -hmm. Um, starting there and then, you know, having, I guess, that discussion with your doctor. Um, If you are looking at supplementing with magnesium, then I would be doing it carefully and with someone overseeing it and starting off at a really low dose and continuing, you know, to measure your magnesium levels over time. Um, You know, look, I don't know how you would go with having that conversation with your nephrologist about the research into high magnesium levels actually being um, better for patients without dialysis, but that's definitely something that you could bring up um, and, you know, I guess do it in a in a safe way where it's able to be measured, which I think then will also, also helps putting doctors at ease that, you're not doing something that could potentially be harmful. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's a, it, it's a difficult one because there's, and I think it's a difficult one as well because there's no great test for it. So it's yeah. different, you know, from something else that we can, like iron that, you know, yes, the test for that needs to be interpreted in a certain way but um, is a bit more clear cut. Yeah, don't start me on iron. <laughs> so, I was like, that was not a good example. <laughs> your iron levels are normal, but your ferritin levels are totally true. But that's okay. You're not anemic. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it is. It's a really tough one. And again, that's 
you know, why we do these videos to help educate people and to get people being able to advocate for themselves and to think, well, maybe I am magnesium deficient. Maybe I need to put it in. So if someone did want to put in some magnesium and, and our recommendation, both Emily and I would be to work with a naturopath or an integrated physician um, to do that and make sure you're regularly. And I'm when you're first putting it in there, I'd be weekly checking. I don't know about you, but I'd be checking it weekly just to make sure, especially if you're di- um, on dialysis, yeah. that you're are able to keep up with it what are the different types of magnesium what are the different forms what should be people um especially we can go through the different um stages of kidney disease but what are some of the different forms of magnesium and how do you know if you've got a good supplement versus a bad supplement yeah so there's god i can't even tell you i wouldn't even know how many different forms of magnesium supplements there are out there Um, and by different forms what i mean is that the magnesium is I guess, attached to a different form of molecule. So, for example, magnesium citrate is attached to a citrate molecule. Magnesium malate is attached to a malate molecule. And what that does is, well, part of what it does is it changes how well that it's actually absorbed by the body and how easy it is for the body to um, to use it. So it's really what it's attached to that changes that. Um, and also what it's attached to um can have some of its own actions as well so sometimes I'll change the magnesium that I'm prescribing because uh I want some of the actions of you know of the magnesium but also what it's attached to does that make Mm. sense it does so do you have a um do you have a particular type that you like in kidney disease or late stage kidney disease I know I've got my special ones that I like to use but what about you um I think you know particularly for people with kidney disease, magnesium citrate um, is really good because it's also alkalizing to the body. So you're getting the benefits both of the magnesium but also of, you know, basically being used as an alkalizing supplement. And we know that having a more alkaline body is incredibly important for for people with kidney disease. So that's definitely one that, um, that I like to use. Um, then... Depending, you know, you can also get some good supplements that have dif- a blend of different forms of magnesium, which can be useful as well because, as I said, they're all absorbed slightly differently um, and they all have slightly different actions as well. So using a blend of magnesium, I like magnesium bisglycinate um, for a couple of reasons, one being it's really well absorbed, but second being because the glycine is really good for stress and needed for neurotransmitter function, helpful for sleep. Um, so I might use it uh, for people who are having sort of more problems there. Um, and then probably the other one that I would sometimes use would be magnesium orotate. Uh, and that's because it's got a really high affinity for the cardiovascular system and for the heart and for um, heart function as well. Uh, so, yeah, they're probably yeah. the ones that I would be the most common I would prescribe. Yeah, and I like mag theonate, but that's because I'm working with lots of neurodegenerative diseases. Theonate mm-hmm. has a massive affinity for the brain, so if you've got people with Alzheimer's or MS, Parkinson's, um, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. I don't think any of the others do, but theonate does. Mm-hmm. So, um, But, yeah, I want to go back to magnesium citrate. Um, that's my big, big one to use, especially in the early stages of kidney disease. In fact, mm-hmm. magnesium citrate is a much better alkalizer than bicarb because uh, magnesium citrate, the way it donates its um, alkalizing molecules, it's not going to dampen your um, digestive acids and things like that, but bicarb will do. And so you don't have this change on your digestive function that, because a lot of people with kidney disease, of course, are taking high doses of bicarbonate soda, but that is suppressing your digestive function and your um, digestive acids, whereas the magnesium citrate doesn't have that effect. Um, If people want to do it through foods, what are some of our foods that are nice and high in magnesium um, that are kidney safe? (laughs) <laughs> yes. So this, <laughs> um, this is the other difficulty and this is why as well a lot of people with kidney disease are also deficient in magnesium is because a lot of our high magnesium foods are also our high potassium foods. So mm-hmm. people who are following a low potassium diet are likely to be magnesium deficient as well because they're just not eating enough of those foods um, that they're going to find magnesium in. Another really important reason not to follow a low magnesium diet if you don't need to. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, it's in a lot of our fruit and vegetables, so our leafy green um, veggies, nuts and seeds as well, high in potassium. Um, Yeah, it's really difficult actually to find foods high in magnesium that aren't high in potassium. Can you think of any? They go together, yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, like bananas, they're like high magnesium, high potassium, but most people are told to avoid them. Um, I don't know how much magnesium is in avocados, but obviously the avocado, high potassium, great, full of amazing, great healthy fats and things like that, and all our, most of our kidney patients have taken them out. And Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. You're absolutely bang on there. Those foods go together and, of course, most people are following low potassium, which means they become magnesium deficient, so it's a really tough one and that's it's hard for it's hard when we're trying to advocate for our patients that work with us and following the program because even um you know we minimize it in our diets and things like that because of those big blanket rules and trying to work with nephrologists but it's one of those things where we want to educate people to go you really need to blood test and you need to treat you as an individual not a disease just because you've got um you know a later stage of chronic kidney disease doesn't mean that you need to admit um, magnesium and, and potassium out of your diet. You really need to test these things. And then if you are deficient and showing signs and symptoms, putting them in, but doing that in a way where you're continually testing and monitoring to make sure that it doesn't cause any long-term actions. And as you mentioned, you know, long, but long-term potassium deficiency Um, sped up the decline of kidney disease and we know now that high levels of magnesium improve outcomes which is totally contrary it's totally the opposite of what people with kidney disease are told and again my major frustration of when people just get into a slap bang prescription one size fits all and we're working with individuals here and really individualized biochemistry and it's not all it's not one size fits all we really have to work with individuals and I think that's that's really important for our community to remember and being brave enough to educate and self-advocate um I know how hard that is because some doctors not all get a bit of a gold complex especially when they're specialized so the more specialized I know this with neurologists that I deal with um And, you know, it can be really black and white for them. And so, again, I really want to reiterate that if you feel strongly that you potentially have a magnesium deficiency and you'd like to put it in, at least try it, and your um, primary health care physician isn't supportive with that, you need to find another primary health care physician that will at least work with you because it's rational to think if you say, look, I'm going to blood test every week and, you know, you're not being... um, what's the word I'm looking for, irresponsible, you know, that's, you know, especially with the new research. So, again, it's you've got to be brave enough to advocate for yourself. And I know when you're sick and you're dialyzing three times a week, that extra energy to do that can be really tough, but it may just add on a year to your life. We, you don't know. So, um, yeah, it's really important to have a look at that. And um, if you can flick me that um study i know i've seen it but the i'll add it in the links below so yeah. if, if this is something that interests you and resonates with you and you want to try some magnesium at least you can take the study to your nephrologist for them to look at and see if they're mm-hmm. open-minded to having a look at that stuff anything else you want to add about our wonderful magnesium emily um i just dosage, love it i know i do too i don't think we talked about dosage range did you want to go oh, yeah. through that Um, Yeah, and I guess one thing also to flag with dosage is that when we're talking about dose, we're thinking about elemental magnesium. So depending on uh, the label of the product, I guess, that you're using, often you'll see a total magnesium amount and then it should also have an elemental magnesium amount. And that was one thing that I found really interesting recently uh, at my at work with one of the doctors. Um, I work in a cardiovascular ward, so we do have a lot of patients on magnesium supplementation. There is a specific form that everyone gets put on, um, which is written up as magnesium five hundred milligrams. So they'll get put on, you know, one and two, one or two. Um, what I know is that the elemental magne- amount of magnesium in that supplement was, I think it's 33.6 milligrams. Wow, um, not much. No, not much. So it was only the other day that one of our doctors um, 
actually cottoned on to the fact that her patient wasn't getting 500 milligrams of magnesium. They were getting 33.6. And she came to me and she said, oh, did you know? And so I, I put them on this different supplement and I was like, but didn't you know? Like, And I think that that isn't something that is commonly known. So um, often I think doctors might think that someone's taking a therapeutic dose of magnesium. It may even be what they've put them on themselves, but it's well below therapeutic levels. Um, so that's one thing to be aware of. Yes, very good point. So what is the therapeutic, I know, yeah, what what do you like people to sit on magnesium-wise, elemental? Yeah. yeah, elemental. So I would generally be looking at, uh, you know, 300 milligrams up to, look, some patients. And again, it would be different if someone was in the later stages of kidney disease, I wouldn't use as high a dose. Um, but looking, you know, 300 to 600, 800 milligrams a day if someone's, you know, I, I know they're magnesium deficient. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, you know, the RDA is for adults, it's about 320 and I think for men 410 milligrams a day. So uh, that's kind of the minimum amount your body needs to be able to, complete all of its functions and that's not taking into account things like stress when we're getting rid of more so if you sort of think about that then you know you were needing to get usually around 300 milligrams to get someone above that RDA into a therapeutic level. And if someone was in stage five and dialysizing and they dialysis dialy- you know what I mean on dialysis yeah. and they want to maybe incorporate some magnesium what dosage would you start them on? So I'd be starting them on 50 to 100 milligrams. That's what I do too. Perfect. Anything else that you want to say about our good friend magnesium? Uh, no, I think I think we've covered most. But although I will say that my in clinic with clients, and these are people with a you know who come to me for a wide range of of, of conditions, it's probably the one thing that consistently I have people coming back and saying oh, my God, I felt different, like mm. I noticed it and I put people on it and I have a lot of people who do not want to, like, don't make me come off that. Like, I'm, you know, I want to keep taking it because it's, it just seems to people really notice a difference when they're on it when they need it. Yeah, I totally agree. I find magnesium is part of my core strategy in treating MS and stress, which is what I see so much of and I get exactly the same feedback. Um, I will say some people with chronic health conditions, and I see it more in people with chronic infections and things like that, not so much kidney disease, um, even small amounts of magnesium, when the um, mechanisms of stress have been going for so long and the digestive system is shut down, magnesium will go in one end and straight out the other. Um, In those cases, you need to use the citrate or the glycinate seems to be better absorbed. So if you find you take magnesium in it, it causes your bowels to become loose. I actually start with the glycinate at a low dose and then just build it up slowly or using um, tissue salt sprays and things like that. And tissue salt sprays might be a really nice way. It's a homeopathic version, magnesium phosphate. Um, might be a great um, way for people on dialysis. You're not going to be getting huge doses, but it's very well absorbed into the mouth and um, uh, you don't have to take it through the digestive tract. Sometimes when people are just too sensitive to taking um, big doses of elemental magnesium, I find the tissue salts actually work very well and they shouldn't have a negative effect on um, filtration through the kidney so much just because of how those tissue salts work. They work at a tissue cellular level. Um, But if you do get loose bowels, there's probably a good uh, suggestion there that you've got stress in the digestive tract and that your parasympathetic nervous system and your um, mechanisms of absorption have been affected. And in those cases, you just need to go slow. And I find, like I say, the glycinate seems to be less aggravating that way. And then you can switch to a citrate or something like that um, once you can get that up. And it generally takes a couple of months of just going very slowly until suddenly the body will absorb it. Um, so just to be mindful of that, if that happens. Yeah, that's um, a good point. Yes. And don't go buying those magnesium, I can't, uh, is it oxide in the, um, from the pharmacy? That is a, that is just to clear your bowels out. Yes. <laughs> so avoid <laughs> magnesium oxide as a form of magnesium because you will not enjoy that, uh, that ride at all. <laughs> Perfect. Anything else you want to add there, Emily? No, I think that's everything. 
Oh, thank you. Um, and thank you for um, sharing that information and the research. And again, it's, you know, it's why we do these videos. You know, Emily and I are always coming up across information and studies. And it's not that we're making this stuff up. We're looking at the latest clinical studies that totally contraindicate and are totally the opposite of what we know that our patients are being told. And so we want to make sure that that information gets out there. So at least you guys are educated and then you can make your own decision. Um, so, Emily, again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it and being so um, uh, capable and effluent in how you um, bring across concepts for people to um, really understand and integrate into their life. I really appreciate you. Um, remember to hit subscribe below. Um, if you want um, to talk, if you're doing our um, kidney disease solution program, which you can find on www.kidneycoach.com, um, or beatkidneydisease.com and you'll find all the information to the program that we're referring to there. If you're on that program and you're thinking maybe I would like some magnesium and maybe I want someone to help me implement that, Emily is very well equipped to work with you to do that. Um, you've heard obviously all her knowledge and her qualifications. She is the only um, kidney disease solution coach in the world by Duncan and myself. So um, you can find her details. You can either email us as support at beatkidneydisease.com Dot com, or you can write into support at kygenesis.com, which is our supplement range, and Emily is answering those emails. So you can reach out to her directly there. Um, and she's more than happy for you to book a consult with her, and she can just totally review everything and just see if adding in some magnesium might be something that would be beneficial for you. And she's, tell me if I'm wrong here, Em, but I know she'd be quite happy to work with you and your nephrologist about getting that in there. And I think her being a nurse sometimes gives her a bit more credibility than working with straight naturopaths sometimes. That's the advantage that Emily has. Mm -hmm. So remember, hit subscribe below, then you'll get um, information whenever we produce new content. If you've enjoyed this, make sure you give us a like um, and give us some comments. If there's anything in particular that you would like to um, hear from Emily or I or have any other specific guests on, make sure you write us a comment, uh, send us an email or um, jump onto our Facebook community, which is just Facebook dot com forward slash kidney coach join our facebook page we have got emily's writing posts there every day we have amazing information and content coming out that is our biggest value here at kidney coach is to make sure that we're inspiring and educating so thank you for being a part of the community thank you for listening emily thank you again for your time and we'll see you next time until then stay well be well bye, bye.